I get asked daily the same questions over and over again about conservations and what they are and what they aren't. So we're going to do an anvil on what a conservation is, not on conserving a particular weapon, but on what a conservation is. So let's get on down a rabbit hole and I'm gonna answer the most frequently asked questions. And here we go. Cold police positive in 3220. Beautiful gun. If you collect a degree of oxidation, if you're collecting how screwed up this gun isn't, you're in the game. But I don't know how well this color's coming out, but this thing has got this brown, almost purplish looking color on it. And I hate to break it to you guys, but this gun has got more rust on it than it really ought to allow to have. This is a prime candidate for conservation. It is not a prime candidate for wire wheeling. Conservation is stopping decay and not causing damage while you're doing it. The, the, the collector guys have got about an 80 year head start on this by screaming, oh my God, don't do anything to a gun. Well, in a day when you didn't have information, things would have been done to this gun that would have destroyed it. And later on in this video, I am gonna show you the difference between a carding wheel and a wire wheel. We will not be wire wheeling this. However, I'm gonna try something here and show you guys something. If you really get on this thing, and you take all the oil off of this, we're gonna learn that this color is really an oiled layer of rust. And I want this oiled layer of rust to disappear. You can see around the edges where the finger oils haven't intruded. This beautiful charcoal bluing is still existing in here. We wanna keep that. The true pro can get in and get out without you knowing that he was there. So what conservation is, we're gonna stop this decay. I'm looking up at the monitor at this and we really have this lit right. This old girl, if you view it under normal light, it looks like a pretty decent gun. But when you really get up and take a look at it, this thing has been gone after it's scratched, it's whatever. We're not taking any of the scratches out. We're not removing any of that. We're just gonna stop all this rust and down in the pits. What the collectors don't want you to do is take a wire wheel to any existing rust on this and dig down below the surface of this polish and destroy this weapon. They are right in that regard. But the main question becomes, when does a lack of maintenance become patina? I really wish I knew the answer to that. Our next specimen that we're gonna to use to demonstrate what we're talking about is this Gewehr 98. If we look at the top here, we can actually see, let's, let me get that in the mirror right there, 1899 stamp. Long of Azir that we talked about last week. It has the S Patron and Mark on the barrel. Sometime in the early 1900s, this 1898 got updated to the 323 bore with the Spitzer in the longer chamber. So we know this thing has been through at least one period inside of a, of a reefer facility. But since then, I would be willing to tell you this thing has never been taken apart. All of this metal here that's supposed to be in the white isn't. That's all rust. I'm playing the light over here so you can really see it. This has been probably just worn off from handling, but all of this patina here doesn't belong here and shouldn't even be there. So now we're gonna be back up to this deal again. And what I'm, gonna sh what I'm showing you here is that if you take the oil off of this rust and dry this out. And by the way, I've already checked to make sure that this particular brake cleaner doesn't mess the varnish up on this gun. I've already checked that. We blow that thing dry. That is rust. I don't care what you call it. That whole thing right there is frosty. This should be in the bright. Now, when we're doing a conservation, we're going to stop that. 
Are we going to polish this receiver ring back down to the bright? Not really, but what we're doing on a conservation is stopping all of this decay. While we're doing our initial checkout of this particular rifle, we're looking at a couple of things. We're making sure that all the parts appear to be here. We're making sure it's empty. It hasn't had its trigger modified. It has that two-stage trigger pull where you can come up on it and then drop it. It's all here, and that's your big one. You've got to know whether or not you're going to have to do any actual um, refurbishment. I'm going to talk about refurbishment in a minute. So something else that this particular weapon has going on here is that this wood has actually warped up the grain and opened up this mouth here. But I'm looking at the screws in the bands, and I'm looking at the rest of the gun, and it looks pretty good, but it doesn't look to me like it's been out of the stock in a while. So God only knows what we're going to find when we get up in here. Um, the wood has had a lot of impact damage. Again, we're not going to sand anything. But what we want to do is stop all this rust and take this layer of grime off of it. I don't know who... There's something else you got to look at. Look at the gun really well. I don't know who EC was. I don't know if that 1917 is spurious. I don't know who Jack or, or Doig or Doug or whatever the heck his name was, but sometimes you got to be careful, especially Civil War equipment. Oh my God, Civil War equipment's got little spurious things all over it that actually mean something. So step one is do your research. You've just got this Millsurp dropped in your lap. Do some research and find out what it is, who owned it. Is it particularly rare? Is it run in the mill? What do all these numbers mean? Find all this stuff out first. But I would advocate for always conserving one of these things. Just stop it from decaying. And again, we want to stop it from decaying without destroying the underlying weapon. Let's talk about tools. In this particular case, a portable, manually operated, optically guided inertial impact delivery device. You would call this a hammer. This particular hammer lives out in my car for a very specific task, and it does not require its face to be polished. If you hit a gun with a hammer that looks like that, you are going to be in a world of hurt because it's going to transfer every last little mark on this hammer onto the finish of your gun. Don't do that. Your hammers, this is that two-ounce ball pin you see me use every week. And this thing gets its face tuned. And that is what a gun hammer should look like. It should be polished to a mirror. It's not hard to do. Try that sometime. Screwdrivers. This is the kind of screwdriver, even though this is a stubby, this has the blade. I want to show you that that blade tapers. And the taper on this particular blade here it's a straight taper from here to here. So the problem is it's only going to touch a screw head in one place. The kind of screwdrivers that you really want to wind up with is a parallel sided screwdriver. And as you can see right here, this side is parallel to this side right inside the screw slot. Now this is a gigantic screwdriver. We're not going to use this particular one, but I picked it out here in order for you to take a look at where it is. This side and this side are parallel. So what we're going to do here is we're going to mess this towel up for a second. And I'm just going to draw a, a screw slot. In that particular screw slot, oh hey, Bruno just handed me a Sharpie marker. Let's do it this way. Here's your screw slot. Here's your head on your screw, right? We want a screwdriver that's going to touch the entire side. We don't want a screwdriver that's going to sit down in here like this and only touch right there. That's what you're trying to avoid. This screwdriver will cam out of this slot and it will produce destroyed looking screw heads. Um, destroyed looking screw head, exhibit A, right there. All right, the wrong kind of screwdriver winds up chewing up and putting amateur marks all over this thing right here. And I'm trying to, yeah, you can see it right there. We're trying to not do that. We're trying to keep our screw heads clean 
and unmolested in this particular case with a hollow ground screwdriver. Now, I go through a lot of screwdrivers in this shop and I buy them up at a pawn shop sometimes and I'll just grab this particular screwdriver and I'll hollow grind it and I'll just make the sides parallel on a grinder's grinding stone real quick and hang on one second. We just did an obvious fade away here because I went over to the grinder and I ground this particular screwdriver blade parallel. Now I just hacked it out. It took me like 10, 15 seconds. You can do it a little bit better, but you see how the sides of this are now parallel and they are not V-shaped. You can just take a regular screwdriver and grind it. You've committed it to gunsmithing use. That leaves me one other thing here. Hang on a second, let's do this. Let's flip this towel back over again and here's the top of our screw, right? Slot running through the center of it. There's two things you gotta know on how wide the blade is. The blade has to come, come all the way out to the edges. You want the blade to touch all the way out. But what's sometimes worse is if you have a blade that's just a little bit too wide and it's in this fringe up here and it's in this fringe down here, and when you rotate the screwdriver, it tears this nasty gash all the way around the outside of the hole. So what that would look like is, let's say for instance, um, you have a screw with a slight cup on it like this. And here's the screw, right? If your screwdriver blade sits in there like that, you are gonna gash the sides of that mortise right there. So you gotta be a little bit smarter than the egg. Come right out near the edges because you want 100% contact. That's kind of my take on that. You do not need to spend lots of money on bespoke screwdriver sets. Just modify them so that they work. What you'll wind up with is an entire set of screwdrivers for only one gun. Well, if you only own one mill, sir, outstanding. Paint them, do whatever, segregate them someplace, and just know that you have the right tools to take the gun apart. The screw should fit the entire slot and it should not overhang into where it's galling the, uh, the galling the mortises. Punches shouldn't look like this. They should look like this. They should be the same thing that we did to our hammer faces. If you miss with a punch and you hit something, you better hope that it makes a nice clean circular indent that can be easily uh, peened away. So do the same thing with your punches. But that's pretty much it. Um, you want to start with tools that fit, and then you want to make sure that you don't induce other issues in your attempts to do what you're going to do. I've selected the correct size screwdriver bit to get down in here, and we're going to go ahead and lay it inside that slot. It's not too wide. It's exactly, or it's not too uh, wide. It's exactly the right thickness. And we're going to, ah, no, yes. You think I haven't slipped, missed that bit, hit a gun from that far away? You are mistaken. By tapping this bit down in here ever so slightly, we do a couple of things. One, we verify that the fit, the bit is actually a clean fit inside the head. And we're also kind of actually loading the threads a little bit. I don't know how much that matters. We'll come down on top here. Again, you don't need the fancy screwdrivers. You don't have to have the big money tools, but just have one that fits. So we'll take this screw out. And these particular plates happen to be lifting off. That's nice because I'm gonna tell you, Bakelite grip panels that are in that kind of shape do not occur very often. So let's assume that this particular panel wasn't going to lift off. A gentle hitting with a hammer will cause the frame to take off and the, and the, uh, the grip to stay in one place and it will knock off. Wow, those are nice looking grips. So now we're getting up inside this thing already and we're taking a look and we're seeing that I'm gonna spray this a little bit here with some ElectroClean. That even if this weapon had been beautifully taken care of, there's rust all up here, there's rust up inside the frame, there's rust down here on the bottom, there's rust all over this gun even though you couldn't see it when it was oiled knowing that now we take the side plate off we take these two screws off knock the side plate and go around the other side and get the crane 
give that a tap. You can't see through my fingers because I'm holding it in position. And then just, I'm squeezing the screwdriver with my finger like this. And I'm just milking the screwdriver around the corner in order to break it loose. So far, we've been very fortunate. And this particular gun isn't fighting us so far. Just remember that Murphy was an optimist. Now, this screw head has been absolutely destroyed. And I'm going to show you this up close. Once we get this off, we're going to zoom in on this screw head. And I'm going to give you a before and after on this screw head. So we're going to pop this loose. And this one's fighting me a little bit. Now, rust right here in this area is typically what's holding these screw heads up. They're not typically being held up on a thread side it's the fact that this head corrodes into the head mortise and sticks it there to get that loose let's say it wasn't moving to get that loose we would put a small drop of penetrating oil on it a recalcitrant uh, screw head can be lubricated you don't need much see that drop running down that screwdriver tip bang that's all you got to have right there this stuff is great. It will, however, take finish off of a gun. It'll do that. So you don't want to leave it on there long, and you only want to leave it around that mortise. This one wasn't fighting us too bad, but a little bit of uh, penetrating oil there won't kill you. Let me tap this down inside the head. Bang. See, that is kind of tight. I can see why they're messing with that. I'm pushing down on the screwdriver while I'm rotating and giving small jukes back and forth. And in this particular case, we have lifted it free. To remove the side plate, just tap on the frame like this with the back of a wooden handle. Don't go up in there and pry on it. And you see these guns that got pry marks everywhere. As I'm tapping on the frame, I'm moving the frame down. And the mass of the side plate makes the side plate want to stick around and it'll actually knock it loose. So in this particular case, now we're up inside of this bad boy and this thing is nasty. And it probably hasn't seen the south side of an Euro can in quite some time. We note here that there are drag marks, but we're looking for, on our first inspection, is to make sure that all the parts appear to be here. There are several amazing books that are written about how these particular guns work. You don't have to have one of Mr. Kuhnhausen's books, but I'm going to tell you what, they're great to have around, and I, they're my go-to things. I've been inside enough of these, I kind of know what I'm doing. Just go slow, take your time, no files. Don't bring a file in here. All the metal that was supposed to be in this gun is still in it, and you may need to keep it where it is. So I'm looking for spring tension here, and I'm checking to make sure that it's all, and this gun is just dirty. And the action was really gritty. So the first thing we'll do is we'll remove all this dirt. Let's get the cylinder out of this thing first. Press down on the screwdriver at all times. Because you want to maintain contact. This is not a race. You've got plenty of time. Let's see here if that actually came out. Yes, it did. So that's everything I need to do. Now we'll eventually take that screw all the way out. But as you can see here, as we're beginning to disassemble this thing, it's been a long time since anyone's been down inside this. But as you begin to get this apart, you start seeing flashes of brilliance up inside here with the original bluing. This was an absolutely magnificent piece of hardware back in the day. It'll never look like that again. It was only new one time. We're trying to stop all this rust. I mean, look up in here. Yikes. Pulling the Gewehr down. And we're taking a look here and you see all this rust underneath this head i had to use a little bit more force to take this screw out than i would have liked to have used you can see where previous people attempting to take this thing apart have messed up this entire side plate and where this particular screw head has pretty much been annihilated i got it loose with a little bit of penetrating oil and then i've dried it all back off again to show you that the screw comes out easily but most of the rust is right here in the head area We've got this zoom pulled up. You can actually see my heartbeat moving my right hand around. That's how tight we've got this zoomed. This particular screw head has been mauled. It's been mangled by multiple attempts to pull this thing out. And I have to stay inside the camera's focus range here 
We'll clean that screw head up later and I'll actually show you how that's done. Um, the real trick though is, is don't just pull a file out right away. This is a jeweler's bench block. You don't have to have one of these. My God, I got this thing so long ago, I don't even know where the heck I got it. However, when you look at the head of this screw here, and let me get this turned up so you can see it, and you kind of see how chopped up the head of that screw is. We're gonna push some of this metal back. Let me get my uh, patent wood sheath carbon pointy device here. We're gonna push this metal and that metal back down into the screw slot here. We're gonna do the same thing for this screw. Let me roll this up so that it's shiny. You can see that screw right there got nicked up a little bit, but not much. This is the one that retains the bolt. We've got another screw here that was also mauled that was holding one of the side plates on it. You can see that lip standing up. That shiny line right there is a lip. And we're gonna take a hammer and pound all that back down before we pull a file out. Just resist the urge to file all this off. You can do it, but all that metal was there for a reason. And then that leads me to the old to, to, a, to, a, to the last one, which is a goodie here. Let me get this lined up. If you look at this, this came off the Mauser. And you can actually see where they used the screwdriver bit that was too small. And as they were exerting torque, it pushed that dollop of metal up there. And it shoved this dollop of metal down here. And you can see where it had absolutely been messed up but there's lettering on this thing there are markings on this so when we clean this particular screw up we're going to try to do this in a way that we preserve all of that so uh we're going to go over and beat on some things over on the on the uh, on the vice here uh, let's go to universal work holding system so i'm trying to light this in a way that you can actually see that lip sitting there on that screw and i'm just going to tap down this lip Okay, I'm not hitting it very hard. I'm just kind of very, very lightly pushing the metal back to where it's supposed to be. And you can see that shiny line creeping up around it. Now, don't go crazy. You can destroy this screw. I'm going to have to put my fingers in front of it here to rotate it for the camera. You can destroy it. But as you can see here now, let's get the light right. I'm trying to tell a story here for you. Where's the light? There it goes. It's kind of squished down in the center. The slot is sort of squished in the middle, but that's okay. Now I'm gonna roll it some. I'm working on this thing 90 degrees off axis from the camera. And now I'm not pushing down with the saw. I'm just letting the saw ride this is essentially a single roll file, and all I'm doing now is just clearing everything out, rotating it a little bit. Now the screw's never gonna be new, but it's pretty close. So let's keep going here. Now there's extra material on the sides. Here, let me get this back up. Okay, there's extra material on the sides, sticking out of the sides of the slot right there and that will come off we're, we're going to take a file to it now very hard to show this to you because we get this thing zoomed like crazy all right let's do another one so not everybody's comfortable doing this um but but it, you got to do it so this is part of the refurbishment refurbishment is putting existing equipment back into operational order now I can make these screw heads look really, really, really glitzy. We did that when we made the screw for that charger loading Lee Enfield. In this particular case, we're just gonna clean these heads up a little bit. And then you almost could use a little bit of cold blue on them to make them turn blue again. Just very, very lightly cleaning this out. We're not moving any metal. You can buy a $60 screw slot file. And if you were working on an English gun that had been bodgered up, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. But in this particular case, this is just a Colt revolver. Okay, so, here, hang on a minute. Let me get down into the field of view here. Here we go. You see there's a little bit hanging over the edges, but we got this slot cleaned up nice. This is just my battery-powered drill motor mounted in 
universal work holding system so that we can spin we can spin this screw and you can see it going around you can see the parts on the outside i want to get rid of just a standard mill bastard file nothing crazy we're not going to use a tremendous amount of force here we're just going to you can see that silver line that showed up there not doing anything crazy we don't want to change the size of the screw any we just want to even it up okay got that evened up there I'm not getting really nuts here with this let me let me change the lighting a little bit and really show you what I'm talking about get rid of that do me a favor punch that light out right there just take the red button get it yeah there we go okay because I'm really trying to show them what we're doing here. There we go. So as you can see, all the marks are off of it and everything, and it's just basically cleaned up. Now, piece of felt or anything that's hard but not hard, piece of 400 grit paper, and I'm just gonna press down on it like this. And make that little spot in the center, and maybe a little bit up here on the sides, and just clean this up. Okay, I'm going to do this now for the rest of the screws in, and we're going to go back to a dedicated uptight. I mounted all these screws now on a piece of cardboard just to show you something here. We didn't, we didn't use any chemicals. We didn't use anything other than just a light couple of taps with a hammer to push all this metal back down into the screw slot. Then we went back over to the carding wheel and steel wooled these things and just cleaned them up, make them look good. Edges are still sharp. Assembly numbers are still on them. Ownership marks are still sharp. And it doesn't look like we messed with it, and yet... We pushed all that metal back that was originally there. This is the guy we polished. This is the guy we didn't. Both of the screw slots are straight, but you still got all this roughed up stuff. And I'll go back in here and polish this. Then maybe a couple of seconds and something to go ahead and eat them, knock them, dull them down a little bit. Um, just sit it there in character. You don't want to come back and make these screws look brand new on a gun that, we, that looks like it's 40 years old. So just remember that. Try to do no harm. Make it look like you weren't there, and you will be golden. All right, moment of truth. We're going to pull this bottom metal. We're going to take a look up underneath here, and we're going to see a layer of mung. There's rust here. It's almost like sand. It's almost like termites got in this thing. I'd be willing to bet you that I'm the first guy up underneath the stock line on this gun in a while. Let me reset here. Okay. Let's take a look at what's going on up underneath here. This is why you got to take old mill serps apart. You got to do it. I don't know if that's showing up any better. I'm looking to Bruno here for some input. There's rust here. There isn't significant pitting, but it would not have taken much longer before this gun actually starts to pit. There's rust in this zone. This thing is nasty, and it needed help, and we're going in here to do it. This is why you take the stock off a of mill serp, and this is why you conserve these things. And this is why I'm showing you guys how to do the maintenance. So we're doing an, an initial inspection up underneath the stock line here, and we're looking at the cross bolt. And this isn't as bad as you think because there's no oil impingement here and this cross grain wood is still carrying recoil load up and around the magazine box here and here this weapon is tight structurally there's nothing wrong with it structurally it's a little scary when you get back here hang on a minute here grab get me in on this oil right here there it is good this is oil right here that has kind of seeped in, oiled, um, what do you call it, dried on grease. Um, I don't know what that is that is seeped down in. But typically as the recoil lug area in back fails, the entire action will set back this way and will start driving a scab of wood off here, which it hasn't done. This is incidental damage here. There's no drive back. We're not setting this. O3s are famous for this. O3s will climb out of their bedding and you get this big crack back here where the point of the pencil is and the owner will say I want you to fix the crack when in fact what I need to do is re-bed the gun up front. It needs to be re-bedded up here by the recoil lug. So in this particular case this weapon is structurally in pretty good shape. When we look down the bore that might very well be a different case. 
there is a point in the disassembly of some of these guns when you need to just stop. Okay, so this star is spring-loaded. However, in order to take this star the rest of the way off this cold, and this is where you're paying me to know what I know, those four little stakes right there, one, two, three, four, this is the end of a screw coming up through the end of this star that has been staked in place. I highly recommend you don't clear those stakes because you've gone too far. So like when you come up on things that have been peened, when you come in, there are some things that were obviously never intended to be taken apart, and this is one of them. Can you still conserve this with the spring in it? Yes, you can conserve it with the spring in it. You just got to remember that all of the water has to be gotten out of the inside of this thing when you're doing it. And I'll make sure I'll bring that up. And this has to be kerosene bathed and exercised in the kerosene um, in order to make sure that you get all the water out. Because that's not a very, very thick spring inside here pushing this uh, star back. And if you corrode that spring, it will not take long. It will snap and then you will have to clear the four stakes. Many of you will probably not be comfortable taking something this far apart. But I'll tell you what, this is one of those deals where a cell phone is actually worth its weight in gold. Take photographs on your way out so that you can put it back together again on your way in. I'm not uncomfortable dumping one of these out of a box. It's time to put this together. You, on the other hand, probably don't want to do that. Um, as you get down inside, be mindful of the fact that there are springs and plungers and all kinds of little deals here that have to be disassembled and taken apart. I have all the tools at my disposal. What you guys have is the luxury of time. I don't have the luxury of a fabulous amount of time to do this. I can probably get into and out of one of these guns completely in under three hours elapsed, probably 25 to 30 minutes of total actual touch time, and the rest of it's waiting for the, for the various processes to finish. So this thing is nasty, it's gnarly, but I gotta tell you, man, there's some spots on it that look beautiful. We'll come the rest of the way down, and we'll get this thing, and we're gonna go talk about boiling water and what dihydrogen monoxide can and cannot do for you this is a little i don't know french fry gizmo we got just because it's electric powered and it's easy i'm putting the small parts that i don't want to lose through the basket the screws and the itty bitty bits and one of these little tea balls you can buy at a hardware store or grocery store for making tea not a hardware store but you know what i mean you don't need anything this sophisticated, but we like it because it's electric powered. It's easy to fire up and, and shut down again. So I've got all the major parts sitting in the basket. I put the screws in there and it's literally this difficult. You just drop it down in the water and you let it cook. Now I've got a lid for this thing in the other room. We drop on top of it. Don't let it uncover. Um, you can put it on a turkey burner. And I don't know if you can see inside here how nasty the inside of this lid is, this, this pot is. You can do this on a stove top with a, with a handgun. Go buy one of these purpose-built pots, eight, 10, 12 bucks at Wally World. Do that, don't use one of your mom's pots because all of the oil and all the sludge and all the grime is gonna wind up on the inside of this thing and it's nasty. I mean, it's, uh, there's a layer of sludge on the inside of this that's pretty nasty, but all you're gonna do is boil it. More than 30 to 45 minutes at a crack doesn't get you anything after about 45 minutes. That's straight water. I'm not worrying about getting water on the inside of the barrel. I want rust on the inside of the barrel to convert from red to black oxide. That is all we are doing is exposing the rust in this setup, the red rust, to a high energy um, environment with a lot of oxygen in it. And an electron moves and the iron passivates. It's that simple. I'm not going to do the chemistry here. Please note that we have not done the grips. Now doing long stuff requires a little bit more, uh, a little bit more finesse here. So let's go take a look. All right, this is a 10 foot piece of gutter you can get down at any Harry homeowner store. 
and I've had to describe this to a couple of people before about taking a gutter. We're going to make a tank for this, uh, for this action out of this. It's only got to be a couple inches longer. There's nothing set in stone here. It's just... I am the carbon-based life form. Are you kidding me? Anyway, now we got a piece of gutter. So we're going to reset here, and I'm going to show you what we're going to do to the ends, because that looks like that was not out by a trained rat. Note that there's a right and a left to one of these. There's a box of rights and a box of lefts when you buy this, and you'll find out why when you get down here. But this is just basic tinsmithing. We're going to throw this in. We'll have to bend it all to make it fit, because let's just face it, I've annihilated it. Then the next thing we're gonna do here is just glue this thing on. Now, I've told some people about RTV, room temperature vulcanization. It's bathtub caulk, just get a tube of this. It's like $4 US. Um, I don't know it's available over in Europe. I really don't know. We're gonna demonstrate this on the end of this that I have not gone after like a trained rat. However, I would tell you that this is not the first time I've ever done this. So we're just going to blast a little bit of blast a little bit of this caulk down into the down into the seam here. It's only got to be watertight for about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, this thing is going to be watertight. Um, it says in about 20 or 30 minutes. Just follow the instructions on the tube. Do what you got to do. This is Harry Homeowner and a half right here. So I've glued this end cap on. And in about 20 or 30 minutes, this end cap is going to be watertight. This glue joint in here will be watertight, or it'll be watertight enough that it'll hang on for you. Let's just bend that over there and make that, make that stay. So you glue both end caps on this thing, and then when it sets in accordance with the instructions on the tube, we're going to take it outside and set it on a turkey burner and boil some water in it. All right, it's really bright out here, and I don't know what's going on with the cameras, and there's a thunderstorm getting up, and well, it's just a standard South Carolina afternoon. This is the rig. It's a gutter with two ends glued on it and a couple of turkey burners underneath it uh, letting fly. Does it have to be this sophisticated? No, you can do this with one burner. That's a lot of water. There's a lot of free surface effect in there, you know, and it's a lot of water. So you got four or five gallons of water running at a rolling boil here, and you wouldn't spill an entire pot of your mom's soup on you, so why would you spill this on you? So just use a little bit of due diligence, but this is straight up water, nothing fancy. And we're gonna just let this thing cook in here for about, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. You may have to come back out and do it again. So when you pull, the, when you pull it out, don't, uh, don't, don't break the rig down until you're absolutely positive that you're done. Um, but this is it. This is $10 worth of stuff sitting here. Borrow a couple of burners if you only got to do one gun and let it rip. So we're going to let this boil for a little while. Now I'm using air. You don't have to have air, but I'm just getting all the water off of this stuff just to make it easy to look at. That looks worse than it is. We're gonna change camera angles here and give you a real good shot of what happens now. That's not rust you're looking at that. That's just converted Glock laid on the surface of everything. We are gonna card rust now off of these parts. We're gonna card off the loose oxide. I get asked all the time, what wheel is this we use? You don't need to use a powered wheel. However, if you do, this is a Grobe 1.6 decimal 463 four row wheel. That's what we're using. You can get it from Brownells. You can get it from anywhere you want to get it. You can use two row wheels. You can use a variety of other things that I'm going to show you. Right now, I do things under power because I got to get on about it. All we are doing is very, very lightly running this surface oxide off. And this wheel is so soft. 
I can touch it with my fingers. Now, I'll have to degrease it again. In this particular case, we're not doing any actual bluing. We're just carting off block. But as you can see here, this side is now shiny. That side has still got all its nastiness on it. We have used no chemicals. So the question has been, you know, you say don't use a wire wheel and yet he's using a wire wheel. This is not a wire wheel. I'm gonna show you a wire wheel here in a little bit. And I'm gonna tell you what destroying something looks like. This is a wire wheel. This has a wires that are probably 15, 20 thousandths of an inch thick. This thing, if you get anywhere near this, this thing will hurt you. This is not a carding wheel. not a carding wheel. You put your finger in that, you will pull back a bloody stump. So let me show you something here. This bar of steel is shiny. Here's your rusted gun. So what happens when you wire wheel down to the bottom of this? This is what the collectors don't want you to do. They don't want you to grind this off. It's not shiny anymore. You've ground down to it. We still don't have it all. You can't see it in this camera angle, but there's pits in this thing that we're not getting down to the bottom of. So yeah, you can take rust off with a wire wheel, but you're gonna damage stuff doing it in the attempt. If you're wire wheeling something that's throwing sparks, that's pieces of your gun burning. This is a wire wheel. That thing we were carting with is not. I now hope I've made that abundantly clear to everyone. But for right now, I'm just getting all of this accumulated Glock off the inside of it. And then we'll oil it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But for right now, you don't want to put any oil on this because you haven't made the decision to go further. So as you can see, that part started out kind of looking like this it was all dull and it had all that oxide on it let's find something that's a little duller and has oxides on it there you go so you see the difference so you can come in here and do this i don't want to do it all because i want to save some of this for the other methods of doing this that don't require you to have a 600 hundred dollar long shaft buffer you don't need this buffer however it sure does make short work of knocking this oxide off and you can see there see how it's all red down inside this wheel is very, very pliable, and it goes down in there, and it just knocks all that oxide off, but it's not taking off any bluing. There are other ways to card this, but if you'd like to see an entire gun done, go back and look at Blue or Not to Blue number one, where we did a Shamlo Delvine that came out beautiful. Let's look at other methods of carding. A little bit of acetone and some 4 aught steel wool. Little known fact that um, steel wool actually has a little bit of oil on it to keep it from rusting. So all we're going to do is just put a little bit of acetone in there. You don't need much. It doesn't have to cost a whole lot. You don't need a gallon of it. We'll put this cover on it and just shake that around in there and let that get thoroughly soaked. Pull that off. And just make sure we get all that oil washed off of that. And let that sit there for a couple of seconds and let the acetone go ahead and fume off out of it. All right, I've let that sit there and I've picked it up once just to make sure that all the acetone evaporated out of it. it. It moved. Okay, so let's just move this frame out of the way and take a look at the before and after here. There's the part that I, that I power wheeled right there. And you can see how nice and shiny that is. No chemicals, no abrasives. This is a piece that's got a lot of chemical on it. I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of um, converted rust on it. So all I'm doing now with the degreased um, steel wool 
is just walking in and wiping this off. And as you can see, it gives you exactly the same effect. It's the same, it takes a lot longer to do a gun with a piece of steel wool. I do stuff with power, but you don't need thousands of dollars of high-speed equipment to do this. You really don't. As you can see here, we didn't damage anything. I'll have to get up inside this crack. And I've been asked, well, how do you get up inside of a magazine tube? The answer to that is simply toothbrush, Mark One, Mod Zero. This is my bench brush right here. And you can just go in and scrub it. You can get off the inside of, uh, down inside of receivers this way. You can get stuff that's inside where you don't want to put your fingers. Now that wire wheel over there would have gone after this. I'm sorry, it's not a wire wheel, it's a carding wheel. So now that leads me to tell you the difference between a wire wheel and a carding wheel. There's still stuff that has to be gone after. You got to do the whole gun, it takes time. Point being though, is you went from something that had all this oxide on it to something that doesn't. And you have to go through there and clean all that out. That's not rust, that's a loose oxide. That stuff will come off with your fingers. Now if it doesn't, you may have to boil it again. Let me see here, let's go after it, there you go. See, it's coming off, all you gotta do is scrub it off. And you may have to boil it again after you rub it one time if the, if the rust is really pervasive. Um, however, this is the whole thing. We just converted a red oxide to a black oxide and then we've whisked off all the oxide. Now, if I wanted to turn this plate white, all I have to do now is very gently chemically remove the bluing. I don't have to grind it off. And that's the key, is you take red rust, convert it to black rust, and then chemically remove it, and you can still preserve all the polish underneath it. When you are done conserving, it's going to look like this, and you're going to go, oh my God, what have I done? Yeah, but I'm going to tell you what, you keep on going, and you, you card, and look what it looks like after we've carded it. Oh, baby, look at that. I haven't got up inside the magwell yet, but I've carded this in order to show you this is what the original bluing on an issue weapon looked like. Look at that. So none of that's been damaged under stock line. We got here soon enough. You guys saw all that sugar rust. Look at this, the Vizier is awesome. I mean, it. We, we, got, we got here quick enough. We got here soon enough. So the underside of this barrel looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and finish carding this whole thing out. We're at a decision point here about what we're gonna do with kerosene, and this is where I wanna describe it. This particular gun right here was not kerosene, and it is, it is still, it's been conserved. I'm actually gonna to try to get the light off of it to show you the fact that it's still, it's rough. This is an 1886 Winchester and 4590. This is going the rest of the way. This gun is going to have it's finished punched up, it's gonna be rust blued. That's a different episode, but you're at a decision point. Um, like right now, Miss Katie is, the, the wood's been finished, Miss Katie's checkering it. If you've been watching my Instagram, you'll see that we're gonna take the lettering off the barrel. Because it's in 1886, it's kind of a rare bird. However, we've done the research, and this again, is not Lawrence of Arabia's rifle. But if you're gonna go the rest of the way, the rest of the way. We've done a couple of guns like that on, on previous anvils. This Johnson, this Kammerlader, and this Model 12 all looked like that Mauser when they walked in here. The wood was gray, the metal was white with red and orange flecks all over it. Um, for those of you guys that went back and watched this Kammerlader, this whole, this particular gun was broken in four, there's five separate screws in here that are that long embedded. The gun came back, it killed its two deer, it's been refreshed, it looks great. This, uh, this Johnson, when we did the episode on it, we weren't all the way done. We've since made the missing buffer piece for back here. We've made a new bowl handle for it and this thing is right as rain and getting ready to walk out of here. So if you're gonna go the next step after refurbishment, you got it all running. Now are you going to go ahead and do, do go further, bring, wind the clock back. Each one of these guns has been wound back till it looks like they're about 30 or 40 years old. It's actually, um, it's a decision point you're at. So now we're going to go talk about why we kerosene things. The owner of this Colt does not want to go the rest of the way. So this has come out of a vat of kerosene. It's come out of a tub, my, my hanging pot. 
We can still see that the bluing's missing here, but there is no rust. This thing is clean as the day it was made. This is what we're talking about. We still have to pull a bore brush down the bore. There are a couple other things we have to do, but we're not going any further with the gun. That was in just a tube. This particular little pot right here, this is a Harbor Freight special. You don't need anything like this, but I like using this. And we've had these soaking in kerosene overnight. Um, cylinder, and you can see on a cylinder, there's some, there's some missing, that's just, that's flat up flame erosion. Um, you can shoot black powder 3220s in these, and there's probably a little bit of that. Um, you remember I said yesterday that this needs to be, this needs to be flaxed underneath inside the kerosene pot. I know you can't see through my hands, but we want to get that underneath to make sure that there's no water left on the inside of that. All the other parts are laying here, including, uh, where's that itsy bitsy screw that was all worked up here? We're going to have to find that a little bit later on so that we can go fix the head of that. That one's messed up. Yeah, so anyway, somewhere in here is the screw we have to unhork. Um, that goes over there. Um, why kerosene? Kerosene displaces water. However, and diesel fuel displaces water. Gasoline displaces water. Diesel fuel, you can do this in diesel, but it makes a mess. Kerosene's available here in the States if you know where to look for it. Kerosene used to be a byproduct of the production of gasoline, but since they went from distillation to cracking, it's getting kind of hard to find because in order for them to make kerosene, they have to make it. It's not a byproduct anymore. So in Europe, I don't know if you can get it. You might have to use diesel. Do not, under any circumstances, use gasoline for this. It will work and the fumes will just roll off this, roll down onto the floor. They will find an ignition source and you will have a negative outcome. So just don't do that. Why not gun oil? I don't want to use gun oil because at the end of the day, this oxide coating that we want, the desirable oxide coating that we want is a black rust. We don't want an oil that's specific function in life is to remove rust first. So the first thing I like to do is soak all of this stuff in kerosene and your barrel, when you're all the way down and you know you got your barrel converted, take your, um, take your gutter, roll it up on one side, put enough, just enough kerosene in it to cover the action and let it soak for a couple hours. It drives the water out of the coating, it drives the water out of, out of nooks and crannies and it sets the finish. And I don't know how else to tell you that, but it hardens off this bluing and it just makes it more durable. So at this particular point, we knew this gun was not going on to have a, a further rust blowing. We made the decision to go ahead and kerosene it. And I think it looks pretty good. So here we have the Gewehr 98, made in 1899. There is some pitting on this up here. These pits are here and there's nothing you can do about it, okay? But there's no rust down in the bottom of them. We look around the back end of the Longa Vizier and we look at all the things that were screwed up before and we pull back here and the money shot is right there. That's the money shot right there. Look at that. All that lettering is crisp and readable. This is a numbers matching year one Gewehr. Incredible. Now, if we look at the bottom, we look at the bottom of this action this action was in the white and all of this was white when we pulled it out of the stock and now we have very gently converted all the rust back off of it and i lightly and i'm going to admit to lightly having chemicaled it with just a very very diluted sulfuric acid solution in order to bring it back to white the pits are still here the, the numbers and letters are still extremely readable. Hang on a minute, red, red, uh, red again. And nothing on this has been adulterated. All we have done is cleaned it and taken it back to where it should have been in the first place. And I'm gonna tell you what, this is what I mean by do the maintenance. We are not talking about grinding on this thing. We're not talking about messing anything up. We're not removing anything off the stock. We're not doing any of that. All we are doing is stopping it from decaying. I hope 
that this episode has actually shown you folks something what I'm talking about. And I try to grab it all together in one place. And as always, it has been a distinct pleasure to help you guys see on the flip side.